All right. It's good to see everybody tonight. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 12. Since we've been talking about Abraham, I wondered there for a minute if Brother John was going to lead in Father Abraham. That one takes a little longer to get through, though. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12. We've, uh, we've looked at how the book of Genesis is constructed and uh, how the Lord took us step by step from each critical event and person uh, in the history of the world up to this point, all the way down to Abraham. And this is where the story really, really slows down. The Bible wants to focus on him. We talked last week about God's call to Abraham. When God called Abraham uh, from Ur of the Chaldees, uh, of course, what the Bible tells us about Terah, his father, is a past that's not, not real pleasant, right? Not real pretty. Um, salvation's always been by grace, okay? Uh, Abraham no more earned his call than we earn ours uh, when the Lord speaks to us. So, uh, but God has spoken to Abraham. Abraham has uh, been called from Ur of the Chaldees. And in Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses is what we want to cover tonight. As we look at the covenant that God made with Abraham, uh, people call this the, of course, Abrahamic covenant. But the covenant that God made with Abraham, it says in Genesis 12 verse 1, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I'll make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So again, this is called the Abrahamic Covenant. It's a covenant that God made with Abraham. There are many promises made to Abraham here, and that's kind of going to be what we focus on tonight. Now, by, by way really of introduction or by way of this first point, we want to talk about what, it, what is a covenant. Right? What, what is a covenant? That's a really complex word that uh, it's real easy to understand. Okay? A covenant is an agreement. Okay? A covenant is is an agreement, usually between two, but can be between multiple parties. When two people make an agreement with each other, that's, that's the simplest way to describe what a covenant is. And really, that agreement can be about anything. Um, you know, if you, let's say you go to buy a car, and you don't have all the money at that point to buy the car, what you do is you make an agreement with the person that's selling you the car. You say, okay, here's the covenant, here's the agreement. You let me drive away with this car today, and I promise to pay you $300 every month until, until I've paid all that you're asking for the car, right? And what you'll do is you'll sign an agreement that says, I'll pay $300 each month uh, until the car is paid off. That's a covenant, right? In the simplest terms, that's an agreement, that's a covenant, I have an agreement with my job. Uh, I will work for them. They will pay me so much money each hour um, that I work for them. That's an agreement that we have, right? I'm not, I'm not there for kicks, right? I'm not there out of the goodness of my heart. We have an agreement, okay? I'll show up for a specified number of hours and I will work. And in turn, they will pay me for that. That's an agreement. Uh, I have a covenant or I've made an agreement with Mandy, right? Before God and before other witnesses, friends and family, we made a covenant to each other. We promised that we would love each other and that we would stay committed to each other uh, until, until one of us dies, as long as we live, right? Th those are all examples of, of agreements. An agreement can be any number of things. Um, now, there's two different kinds of agreements. There's two different kinds of covenants that we really want to focus on and two different ones that are explained for us in the Bible. Now, they would be what you call conditional and unconditional covenants. Okay, those are the two types of agreements, conditional and unconditional. Now, let me explain for you what the difference is between those. If you say that a covenant is conditional, 
you are basically saying that there are terms that have to be followed by both parties. Now let's use that example again of me going to buy a car. That's a conditional covenant. I didn't have all the money to pay for it up front, so we made an agreement. They are going to let me take the car, even though I haven't fully paid for it. They're going to let me drive it uh, with the promise to pay them $300 every month. If I don't pay them that money every month, they actually have a right to come and take the car back. That is a conditional agreement. I did not get the car without conditions. I have to pay for it. I have to pay them a certain amount. If I don't pay, the deal is broken. Now, how about the covenant that I have with my job? Again, that's conditional. They pay me a certain amount of money each hour. But if I stop working for them, they're not going to keep paying me. Just like I'm not going to go work for no pay, they're not going to pay me for no work. That, that is a conditional covenant. We, we, have, we each of us have our own responsibilities in the agreement. Um, now, in a covenant, there can be more than one condition, right? Um, now, obviously, to get paid by my employer, I have to go and work for them. Now, there's additional conditions in that, right? I work with customers. I'm not allowed to be mean to them. You know that? I can't get on the phone with them and, and say curse words and be mean to them and, and lie to them and all those things. You know, that's, that's another condition, right? And if I don't follow that, uh, I could be in trouble. I could lose my job. Um, you know, our job where we work, they kind of have a code of conduct. Now, let me present a scenario for you. Let's say that I'm a good worker. And let's say that I go and I put in all my hours and I work hard and I'm making the customers happy and, and I'm making my boss happy. But then one day after work, I go snooping around other people's desks and I start stealing stuff from them. What happens? I'm going to get fired, aren't I? Because there's more than one. See, there's like actually a lot of conditions in this agreement you start to see. Um, a covenant can have any number of conditions. You realize that's why when the Bible comes, you know, you come to, a book, to the book of James in chapter 2, verse 10, when it's talking about the law and all of the commandments that are in the law. And it says that if you've broken one or if you've offended in one point, you are guilty of all. You know, I, I can lose my job tomorrow for any number of reasons, actually, right? There are any number of things that I could do to break the agreement, to break the covenant. You know, I don't have to steal from people at work tomorrow to get fired. I don't have to cuss at somebody at work tomorrow to get fired, you know? Just like, you know, people that would look at the law of God, and when it says there that if you've offended in one point, you're guilty of all, you know, a lot of people like to look at God's law and say, well, I've never committed adultery um, or, or I've never murdered anyone, right? That's what, that's what a lot of people like to say. People have missed the entire point of the law, right? What, if, I, if I go to somebody's desk at work and I steal something from them, and they, if I'm a thief at work and my boss calls me in and say, listen, we're going to have to let you go, but, but you know what? But I'm nice to all the customers. I may steal from my coworkers, but I'm nice to everyone else. You know, or I, I put 40 hours in, sometimes more, I work really, really hard. No, you broke the agreement, right? That is a conditional agreement. If I tell Elliot, if you clean your room on Thursday, I'll take you to McDonald's on Friday. That's a conditional agreement. If he wants McDonald's on Friday, what does he have to do? He has to clean his room on Thursday. Now, the other aspect of that is what? If he cleans his room on Thursday, I'm on the hook now, aren't I? Right? If he come through with his part of it, uh, I have to come through with my part of it. So those are what we would call conditional covenants, conditional agreements. Now... There's also what you might call unconditional covenants. 
And that's the kind of covenant where there's no conditions. You make a promise, you make an agreement, and you plan to fulfill it without respect of any other terms, right? Um, there are portions, you know, I mentioned being married to Mandy and the covenant that we made. There are aspects of that that are unconditional, right? We made a pledge to love each other, and our promise didn't include, um, the promise of love didn't include any special conditions. You know, I didn't say when I was getting married, I will love you for the rest of our lives as long as you cook me dinner every night. Or we, we will love each other as long as neither of us snore. Now, that's not the kind of promise that we made, right? In fact, most people, if they, if they use a kind of a traditional ceremony or traditional vows, they'll actually kind of emphasize the unconditional nature of it because they'll say whether it's richer or poorer, whether it's sickness or health, right? Because they want it to be unconditional. My love and commitment for you is not based on any conditions that you have to keep on your side, right? Elliot might ask me, you know, I said, you know, a conditional covenant would be if you clean your room Thursday, I'll take you to McDonald's on Friday. Now, what if Elliot asks me just one night out of the blue, dad, can we go to McDonald's? And I say, man, buddy, you know what? I, not tonight. I'm really tired. It's starting to get late, but I'll tell you what, I'll take you to McDonald's on Saturday. And I don't give him any conditions, right? If, if I don't put any conditions on that, I'm not telling him that he has to clean his room. I'm not telling him that he has to do all of his schoolwork. I'm not telling, I'm just saying, listen, I, I can't do it tonight, but I will take you there on Saturday. That, to him, that's the best kind of covenant, right? Because he doesn't have to do anything, right? I, I committed to do it. And every part of that agreement is on my shoulders. There's absolutely nothing that's on his. Unconditional promises are hard because when you make one, you are binding yourself to a future action, right? Uh, in a conditional covenant, somebody else has to keep their end of the bargain as well. But an unconditional promise, you are binding yourself. We are advised to be cautious in those kind of promises, right? Because the Bible would say to us, it would be better for us to not vow than to vow and not pay. Humans struggle with unconditional covenants and promises because we're not all powerful. We're not all knowing, all wise. I may, in, in, in desperation of not wanting to go, Elliot says, right, uh, can we go to McDonald's? No, no, but I'll take you on Saturday. And I didn't put any conditions on that. Well, what if, what if the van breaks down on Friday? Or what if, you know, what if we don't have any money? Or what if I have to go to work on Saturday and work overtime? You see, I made an unconditional covenant, but now I'm not going to be able to hold up my end of the deal. Um, covenants then can really affect your character. Covenants are based complete, unconditional covenants are com based completely on character, right? If, if, if I make a promise, if I make an agreement, um, and I don't put any conditions on it, you have no recourse but to absolutely trust that I will fulfill and that I will perform it. Now let's look at some biblical examples because the Bible gives us some examples of both, right? Let's talk about conditional covenants. In the book of Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, Adam was placed in the garden by God and he was given free reign to, to basically have and enjoy all that he desired, right? Almost. In Genesis 2, verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now you see there, there there's, there's conditions. And if you eat of this tree, then this will happen. Adam, uh, there was absolutely no reason in his own nature 
that Adam would have ever um, struggled with sin in the flesh. Adam was never going to physically die. Adam was going to have, you, you can imagine, Adam would have had irregularly long life. He did anyway, right? Lived 930 years. But of his own nature, there was no cause or reason for Adam to ever die. But the Lord said, you know, you, you, can, you can enjoy the garden and all that it pertains, but if, if you eat of this tree, you, you will die. Right? You have one of those if, then, and you start to see things built on conditions. Think about the Mosaic Covenant. Right? The covenant that Israel agreed to at Mount Sinai. When the law was given at Sinai, God promised to bring blessings to the children of Israel as they followed his commands. You read the book of Exodus, you read the book of Deuteronomy, and you will see that there are blessings associated with obedience and cursings associated with disobedience. That's what we would call conditional. If you do this, God bound himself to do this. If they disobeyed, God bound himself to do this. Okay, so th those are some examples of conditional things that if you, you know, where God committed to something based on, you know, some condition based upon what these individuals would do. Now, there are examples in the Bible of unconditional covenants. Look in the book of Genesis chapter 9. In the book of Genesis chapter 9, God made a promise. Genesis 9, verse 11. It says, And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. This is a promise God made. And it didn't come with any conditions. Did you know that? This promise came with no conditions. So... Let me explain it this way. Did you know that no matter how bad this world gets, God will never destroy this world again with a flood. If man returns to the same level of evil that we did in Genesis chapter 6, God won't judge us with a flood. Did you know that? A worldwide flood. He won't destroy the entire earth with a flood. That is a promise that he made. It's a covenant that he put no conditions on. He put no additional agreements with it. He just said, after he had destroyed the world with a flood, he said, I'll never do that again. And there is nothing in this world that could happen on our part or on our end that would change that, right? So that's what we would call something that's unconditional. In the book of 2 Samuel chapter 7, God made a promise to David that he would not take his seed off the throne as he had done with Saul. And that promise was given to David and it didn't matter. Um, th there was no condition given to that. David was going to have some unfaithful grandchildren, great-grandchildren, some, some descendants that sat on the throne of Judah that were not good men. But God made the promise to David that his seed, that David's seed, would forever inherit that throne. And there was nothing that could happen or would happen that would change that. And obviously we'll see that finally fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as he rules and reigns. But that was unconditional. When God promised that to David, that was not dependent upon Solomon being faithful. And that wasn't dependent upon Solomon be, or Rehoboam being faithful. Future generations often weren't, but God's promise was to David, your seed will not fail upon the throne. And that's, actually, that's exactly how it'll work out. Okay? So those are the things that we want to keep in mind. Okay? That's, that's the basic outline of what a covenant is, and you want to remember that there could be conditional and unconditional covenants. All right, 
Now, number two, let's talk about this covenant that God made with Abraham. In Genesis chapter 12, God is going to do all of these things for Abraham. And when you read Genesis chapter 12, these are not, these promises are not dependent upon Abraham's future generations being faithful, being obedient. Now, some of the blessings and cursings that come along with the law, as far as each individual generation, um, yes, those would be. We see that in the law. But Abraham and his descendants do not have an end of the bargain to uphold, to, to have God fulfill these promises. Here they are. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay? Again, uh, under the Mosaic Covenant, they'll forfeit some blessings and endure some cursings based on their obedience and faithfulness. But those things do not change the covenant. Those things do not change the agreement or the arrangement that God made with Abraham that he would perform these things for Abraham. Now let's look at them in particular here. There's several of them. First of all, he says, I will make of thee a great nation. God was going to make a great nation of Abraham. Now what's interesting is that Abraham's actually kind of an old man by this point. We learn in verse number four that he's already 75 years old. You know, 75 years old, he didn't have any children yet. Isaac hasn't come along. Ishmael hasn't come along. Abraham is just, it's just him and Sarah, right? Well, Abram and Sarai, their names haven't even been changed yet. They're, they don't have any family. They don't have any descendants. But God promised them, to, God promised to make a large nation of them, a great nation. It tells us there, uh, in the Bible, and you'll begin to see later on that it's specifically speaking of the Jewish nation, a physical lineage. Well, there's a dual aspect in that, right? Because making of him a great nation has the physical posterity. And then you come to the New Testament, you learn that there's actually some spiritual posterity that goes along with that, right? Now, what song is it that we talked about? What song do you guys like to sing? Father Abraham. And he had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And what's the next words that you say? I am one of them. You're not Jewish. Well, now, why would you guys say that? Why do we sing that song? You know, because you actually, when you come to the New Testament in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, Galatians, chapter 3, and in verse number 6, Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, it says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So in that blessing, you actually learn, as, as, the, as the revelation of God's word develops, you learn that there was a, a physical aspect of that, and there's a spiritual aspect of that. So I will make of thee a great nation, um, God's going to have to do this. This can't be conditional based upon Abraham. Abraham's an old man. He, he's not going to be able to make of himself um, a great nation. Uh, God's going to have to do this. So he says, I'll make of thee a great nation. He says, I will bless thee. And that seems kind of generic, but God was going to do great things through and for Abraham uh, chiefly among those is that Abraham is going to be saved by faith. We're actually going to be able to read passages as you look at his life, and you are going to be able to see that Abraham believes God, and it's accounted unto him for righteousness. You will be able to see the exact point where Abraham walks out of his tent, looks at the stars that are in the heavens, and when God says, so shall thy seed be, he believes it, but in believing it, he also sees and believes that he's talking about one particular seed, talking about Christ. And when he believes, it's reckoned or counted unto him for righteousness. I will bless thee. Um, there are more blessings than, than physical ones. Okay, There are things that are more important 
than just the physical blessings. But he says, I will bless thee. He says, I will make thy name great. Genesis 12, I will make thy name great. Well, we're, we live 3,500 years, more than that, actually after Abraham, closer to 4,000. We still use words like Father Abraham. When the Jews of Jesus Christ's time referred to Abraham, that's how they referred to him, as Father Abraham. Uh, he made, his name was made great. Abram's name was going to be changed to Abraham. Instead of high father, he was going to become the father of many nations. Uh, future generations are going to look back on Abraham as the father of their people. Did you know that it's more than just Jews that look back to Abraham as the father, being the father of their people? Uh, these promises that came to Abraham, God fulfilled in great and numerous ways. We can often restrict them, but, but there are aspects of these promises that come in great ways. Is it not true that we still count Abraham as the father of the faithful. Abraham's story is still told today. When Paul, preaching in New Testament times, wants to give you an example of faith, who does he use? Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Uh, In Genesis chapter 12, the next portion, it says, I will... uh, Make sure I say this right. So I'll make of thee a great nation. I'll bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Thou shalt be a blessing. Again, who who has not been blessed? Who has not learned? Who has not grown? Who has not seen benefit and been able to rejoice in Abraham? In, In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. We get to enjoy even today the blessing of Abraham, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Do we not still preach faith? Do we not still preach the faith that was first described to us in Abraham? I mentioned this before. Abraham is not the first person in the Old Testament that was saved. But he is called the father of the faithful, and he's the first one that the Bible goes into detail uh, about his personal experience of faith, right? Where he steps outside of his tent that night, looks up at the stars, and believes the Word of God. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee. For future generations and for other families and nations, their blessing or cursing can be tied to Abraham and their relationship to him and his people. Now the pages of history and the pages of biblical history are filled with the stories of those whom God has blessed or God has judged based on their relationship with the nation of Israel, right? Those that persecuted Israel, those that took advantage of them, those that stood in their way, those that warred with them as they went to occupy the promised land, God judged all of these nations. Those nations that found uh, uh, alliance, those nations that, um, that, that blessed, those nations that assisted were often uh, able to enjoy what? Blessings, you know? Temporal, physical, material at times, but those nations were able to find blessing. There are people that, that, that still, you know, this is a part of that verse when it speaks about I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. That, that is probably the most familiar part of the covenant to us because that's the one that, that we feel can apply to us physically. That's one that people feel can apply to them nationally as people, right? You, you've got folks that want to make it um, the, the foreign policy, that want to make it their policy as a nation to, to cautiously deal right with the nation of Israel. God made a promise to Abraham and, and without any additional conditions added to that, those that would mess with Abraham's people ought be very cautious, okay? It's wise for people to recognize God's promise. And lastly, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, there are two aspects of that as well. Specifically, this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
in the seed of Abraham, in Abraham, all nations of this earth would be blessed. You actually come later. And as the Bible tells us, Abraham is able to believe that that is speaking of the seed, of one particular. And if you're not sure, you read, Rome, you read the book of Galatians, how Paul builds a doctrine off of one letter, doesn't he? You get to the book of Galatians, and it mentions specifically that he said seed and not seeds. So Paul builds a doctrine about one letter, saying that that is specifically speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Abraham's seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, all nations have indeed been blessed, right? That's our hope. That is the hope of salvation, both for the Jew and for the Greek, for the, for the Jew, for the Gentile. That is the only hope of salvation, is that particular of Abraham's seed. If there's going to be any people or nation be blessed, it would come through that seed. Now the book of Romans chapter 11 gives us a little bit more general view of it. But in Romans chapter 11, that through his people, yes, specifically Jesus Christ, but even through Israel, the Jews as a people, this world can be blessed. And in him and in his seed, this world would be blessed. Notice here in Romans 11, verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Now, you have to think about this one, right? Because you actually have to kind of, you have to think about what the Bible says uh, about Christ and his future kingdom. But it's true that the fall of the Jews resulted in what? The benefit of the Gentiles. When the Jews rejected the gospel, when the Jews rejected Christ, that allowed the gospel to go out full scale to the Gentiles. We have all benefited from that. But notice what Paul says, if, if their fall led to the blessing of the Gentiles. What about the end of verse 12? How much more their fullness? If you think that we're enjoying benefit now, what about when Christ returns? What about when his kingdom is reestablished? What about when Christ rules and reigns over this world from David's throne in Israel? You want to talk about prosperity. You want to talk about blessing. You want to talk about future enjoyment. When, when that happens... When he returns, when Israel is restored, when these things start to happen, um, that, you're going to be talking about a blessing that's unimaginable. Right? We can only read and, and get a little bit of, of what is in store. He says in verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to uh, emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Wait till Jesus returns and Israel accepts their Messiah. You want, you want to talk about resurrection. You want to talk about what it sees, when, what it means to have life restored. Just wait. This world benefits from the blessing that God gave to Abraham. Specifically, we have benefited in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the same is true. It was true historically. It will be true prophetically that when Israel is in her right place, when God is blessing Israel, the overflow of blessings always abounds to the Gentiles. It just does. That's the promise that God made. So let's get back to our text, Genesis chapter 12. This is what we call the Abrahamic covenant, the promise that God made with Abraham. And it was not dependent upon the future generations and, and what they would be and, and all of those things. This is a promise that God made to Abraham. And you actually learn later when the, when the covenant is reaffirmed in Genesis chapter 15, the writer of Hebrews references, I'm sorry, it, it's uh, 22, Genesis 22 and 26. When the writer of Hebrews looks back and references that, 
he comments that God could do no greater. He could swear by no greater, so he swore by himself. God made a promise, an unbreakable covenant and promise, that these things he would complete and that he would fulfill. So verse 4, Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. We remember last week, God called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees. Uh, he told him to leave his kindred, told him to leave his father and mother. Uh, he didn't exactly do that. He took Lot, he took his father with him, and they stalled at Haran uh, until Terah died. And then when Abraham's father died, it tells us here at 75 years old, they actually resumed the journey. In verse 5, it says, Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. If you're writing down the promises that God made in this covenant, here's another one to add to it. God promised them physically a land. Okay? God promised Abraham and his descendants a land. This is, this is a physical promise. This actually deals with a geographical location. They came into Canaan. God says, this land, I'm giving it to you. Okay? If there's any question, and, and you'll see it later on through the book of Genesis, this covenant is reaffirmed to Isaac, to Jacob, and to his sons. There's not really any question in the Bible who that land belongs to. And so he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, uh, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So he's journeyed into the land of Canaan. He's come to Bethel. And he builds an altar there before the Lord. Bethel is going to actually become a pretty important place in the land of Canaan. Right? It's a place where Abraham builds this altar as he comes into the land. When Jacob later goes on the run from his brother Esau, he comes to, to Bethel and he's able to see that great vision there. And it's a place that he returns to later uh, and again builds an altar, a place that they called the house of God. That's what Bethel means. It's going to become a really, really important spot in the land of Canaan. Listen, God made Abraham some great promises. He made him some promises. Now, when you and I make promises, um, sometimes we make them conditionally. Sometimes we make them unconditionally. We often struggle to fulfill our promises. We are humans. We are weak. We are sinful. We are not as faithful and committed as we often ought to be. There are often unforeseen circumstances that prohibit us from keeping the promises that we make. But one thing you can know of for sure is that when God makes a promise, Hebrews confirms for us, he can't swear by any greater. He can't make, any, you know, that he, when he swears, he swears by himself. And the promises that he makes, you know that God is all powerful to fulfill them. There's nothing that he didn't foresee that's going to keep him from keeping his word. That God's promises are true and that they are sure. Okay, so when God called Abraham, he gave him a great number of promises. And some of these promises we'll see, you actually begin to see as the Bible speaks prophetically, these things are still in the works. God has not abandoned his promises. Israel's under judgment, and in the future day they'll be under great judgment. God will not abandon the promises that he's made. Okay? Father, we're grateful to come tonight. We are, we are thankful for your word.